Hey everybody, I'm Zach. And I'm Jesse. And you're watching In Depth on Now You Know. Sponsored this week by A Better Root Planner. And also sponsored by Ecoware.us. Yeah, I've been, it's been getting chilly. So I'm going to put on a sweatshirt. Oh, what, uh, what kind of sweatshirt is that? It's an Ecoware sweatshirt. Oh yeah. There. Yeah, we sell sweatshirts, I forgot. Now I'm all cozy warm. We have new designs uploaded every week, so head on over to ecoware.us, and we have many different products up there too, and they're all carbon neutral, and a tree is planted for every order. And guess what? What? We just planted our 400th tree. Woohoo! So we're really excited to be partnered with RoboRace. It gives us a great opportunity to share with you the latest technology in racing. Zach and I will be visiting RoboRace in the UK next month and bringing you along for the ride. So I spoke with Matt Smith, He's a systems engineer with RoboRace to share his insights. What we've realized as we've been learning about the amazing new RoboRace technology is that modern racing with internal combustion engine cars sucks. And to get a better understanding of where we're going, let's first look back at the history of racing. What is it about cars racing that makes motor racing such a popular sport? Racing has been around since the invention of the car. And the first recorded races were held back in 1867. Yeah, as Henry Ford once put it, auto racing began five minutes after the second car was built. But these were essentially just reliability trials. It wasn't until 1894 that the first motoring competition was held. 102 cars entered the race from Paris to Rouen and they paid a 10 franc entrance fee. These races were covered by the press and aroused the public's interest. The first American automobile race was held a year later in 1895. The thrill of watching a machine whiz by going faster than anything you've ever seen before was one of the aspects that first attracted spectators to motorsports. Keep in mind that by today's standards, the first car races were incredibly slow. The cars would max out at about 40 miles an hour. But if all you had to compare to was a horse back in 1890s, um, you know, galloping by at about 25 miles an hour, you know, this would be going almost twice the speed. It would be pretty breakneck looking. But by 1949, when NASCAR had its first race in Daytona Beach, Florida, cars could reach speeds of 125 miles per hour. In fact, until its peak in 2005, NASCAR was the highest rated sport in the US. But since then, NASCAR has been on the decline with TV viewership dropping 45%. The most popular motorsport in the world, ranked just below rugby, is Formula One. 550 million people tune in every year to watch some stage of the Formula One season. With speed comes danger. Yeah, Formula One cars can hit speeds of 240 miles per hour. Dozens of drivers have been killed while driving in Formula One, NASCAR, and other motorsports racing. As Ernest Hemingway once said, there are only three types of sports, bullfighting, motor racing, and mountaineering. All the rest are merely games. But more recently, as automobile safety technology has made racing safer with less fatalities and less crashes, has this been making it less exciting. Yeah, the TV viewership of Formula One is also dropping from the peak of 1 billion viewers in 2008. And the average age of the average NASCAR, IndyCar, and Formula One fan has been increasing every year. Today, it's 58 years old, ranking just behind golf and tennis as the league has trouble attracting younger fans. So why is this? Why aren't young people watching traditional motorsports like their parents did? In a recent poll, reasons like lack of technological variety, weak competition, the switch to pay TV, and dumbed down circuits were some of the top reasons. And I think that if we go back to the base reasons why traditional racing is getting a little boring, it's because of two basic things. Okay. Keeping the driver safe inside each car while ultimately the most important concern, it means that the cars can't do dangerous things. They have to go slower and be kept from getting into potentially dangerous accidents, which inherently makes the races less enjoyable to watch. And secondly, we're pushing the limits of what an internal combustion engine can do. We've essentially seen it before. A new season of race cars nowadays looks essentially the same as last season's. And also young people like me have experienced racing from playing video games since they were little kids. They have seen what it looks like to be in the cockpit of their favorite race cars on their favorite race tracks. And they have virtually crashed 
many, many times. Watching others do it safely from a distance just isn't that exciting to a younger generation. And I think another key point is that young people know inherently that burning fossil fuels to make a car go around a track is not a technology they're interested in. Enter the electric race car. As we've seen with Formula E, it has so many advantages over internal combustion engine race cars. They are quieter and cleaner, which means that they can race in places that you could never race in before. Like in the hearts of cities, bringing the adventure right to the masses. And that means that each race season can be unique, never before seen experiences. And the acceleration is insane. Right now, some of the fastest production cars in the world are affordable electric cars, rivaling custom-built sports cars costing 10 times more. For example, the Tesla Model S P100D can go zero to 60 in less than 2.3 seconds. That rivals typical modern F1 cars zero to 60 times. Yeah, imagine if we could all throw a football as well as the best NFL quarterbacks. Why would we watch Sunday night football? Yeah, once you can do what you see on TV in your own car, what's the fun of watching someone else do it? So why does modern racing suck? As we mentioned before, as these race cars have been getting faster and faster and faster, it becomes more and more dangerous to put your squishy human body inside it um, because no longer are we traveling 40 miles an hour, right? right? You can hit a tree going 40 miles an hour and with the right safety precautions, you know, 99% of the time, you could probably walk away. Right. But when you're going 240 miles an hour, that's a completely different story. And why should we be watching a sport where people get killed? There is a long list of drivers who have died on the track. You're seeing the list right now from all of the different uh, motorsports. Now, this isn't injuries. This does not count injuries. This means that they died while driving, doing something that they loved. While it's exciting to see something potentially crash, I think that most people don't want to see people die. The other problem with modern racing is that these internal combustion engine race cars pollute. You know that just one weekend of F1 car racing releases 120,000 pounds of CO2 into the atmosphere. And NASCAR burns 2 million gallons of gasoline in just one season. That's insane. And let's talk about noise pollution. A Formula One race car used to make 145 decibels of sound pollution. Now they've limited that in the past few years to 136 decibels. But if you look at this chart here, that's still between a rock concert and a jet engine taking off. But keep in mind that decibels are not linear, they're logarithmic. So every three decibels, is twice as loud. Let's compare that to a Formula E race, which is rated at 80 decibels. Now that is at cafeteria levels. So right. think about going into your local cafeteria. It's a little bit loud, but that's the level of a Formula E race. Right, you might have to raise your voice. Oh, hey, oh, they're racing by. Oh man, I have to raise my voice a little bit. That is completely different than a Formula One race. You would have to raise your voice. You'd have to be screaming at someone sitting right next to you for them to hear you. I mean, we've got two examples right here. Here's a Formula One race. <laughs> And then here is a Formula E race. You could hear the announcer over the Formula E race. Right. Now this is a problem for getting races into cities. Obviously cities do not want 136 decibels roaring down their city streets. But that's not the only issue. Hearing loss is a major problem for both drivers and fans. For instance, Richard Petty had severe hearing loss from his years as a driver. And if you've ever been to any kind of internal combustion engine racing event, a lot of people, I mean a lot, are wearing headphones. Yep. Because otherwise they would lose their hearing. Yeah, and as you just mentioned, you can't have interesting races if you have to just keep going to racetracks that are outside of town where you can make noise. You'd like to see cars racing through all sorts of country villages or cities, and you can only do that if you're using an electric car. As Matt from RoboRace explains here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the noise is a big part of it. I don't think you'd be able to do any of these Formula E races uh, with Formula One cars, for example or the Monstar cars, because the, the, the volume is just way too loud um, to be doing them in, in kind of residential areas and to, in tourist areas and stuff like that. So that's why they're on dedicated racetracks outside of, outside of main cities. But what Formula E have proven is that you can take electric cars and race them in city centers, in, in, in very populated areas, and have them be successful. You have, you know, we had, an, we had a race in London that I went to, and it was super cool to see racing on public streets that we were kind of grew up around, never imagining that we would have a race there. Um, so that side of it's super cool as well. So I think the biggest nail in the coffin for gas-powered motorsports 
is the electric powertrain. Just like how Big Auto is slow to realize the benefits and Tesla has swooped in with innovation, I think that RoboRace gets it. The, the future of, of motorsport and transport is electric. So over the next kind of half a century, there'll be a massive switch to being electric in terms of just road cars, in terms of public transport, but also in terms of motorsport. And we've seen that with Formula E and we're seeing that with RoboRace as well. And so to be a part of something that's relatively new, which is electric race cars, Formula E were kind of the first to do that on a, on a big scale, and we're kind of second and we're, we're, we're joining them now, but it's, it is the future. And there's so much more you can do with an electric vehicle that you can't do with a, with a petrol powered vehicle. Um, so it's, it's still new and we're still developing and we're still getting better and we've still got a way to go but it, it's the, it is the future, completely. RoboRace fixes these problems. All of them, all of the problems that we just talked about, RoboRace fixes every single one of them. These races are safer, they're quieter, and they don't pollute. And as a result, they can go pretty much anywhere. Now, RoboRace adds a completely new technology never before seen in motorsports autonomous cars. Yeah, I mean, these cars have no human driver in them. Right. And now I know that when you take a human driver out of the car, that the biggest complaint is going to be that there's no human driver in the car mm -hmm. to root for. But I think that's a premature argument made by people who haven't yet had the chance to experience Robo Race. Because let's face it, we're in season alpha. And season alpha is when they're going to be testing out stuff, making things work better. Then we go to season beta, where we fix some things some more. And then we get to our first real racing season in 2021. So I posed this question about humans wanting to root for humans to Matt. What do you say to people who say, yeah, that's all fine and good, but um, I just want to see humans i want to see race car drivers that's that's where the excitement's at like what, what do you say to them it's fair enough i can't argue with that i love watching formula one i love watching formula e i enjoy the human aspect of it but what some people aren't necessarily understanding is that that isn't just what motorsport is motorsport is about the different teams the different engineering the different cars how fast the cars are as well as how fast the drivers are i mean if you look at formula one at the moment if you take a back of the grid team and put the best driver in it they're still not going to win a race it's not just about the driver. The car is as much, if not more, than the driver is. And so for us, we're building really, really fast cars and we're still putting drivers in them, but they're just not human. So a lot of people, a lot of people don't really understand that. They, the drivers are drivers. They're making decisions based on what they can see, what they can feel. It's just a, it's a computer. It's a load of sensors that are hardware instead of humans. It's so interesting to think about having a driver in the car that isn't a human. You know, all throughout history, unless you had a dog driving the car, um, humans have been driving the cars. That's been the only people that have been driving the cars. Now suddenly you have a robot driving the car, mm -hmm. but again, the robot is made by a team of humans who are trying their best to make the absolute best driver and put it in the absolute best car. Keep in mind that we are at the beginning of this sport now with season alpha. The Robo Race teams are learning all about their cars and the technology. And the thing is, even though the cars are autonomous, there are lots of people on each team. Yeah, teams of humans programming and engineering and fixing and planning. All the stories we love about winners and losers, their strategies and failures and victories, because ultimately it comes down to the human members and their abilities, their passions, their struggles to overcome obstacles and to go for the gold. And equally exciting to me is that RoboRace is innovating new features to make racing exciting for the next generation of fans. Like what? Well, like what if you could watch Robo Race cars driving, but you have on VR goggles? Oh yeah, Matt talked about that with me. Really? Absolutely, we have a, a VR rig at the moment, which is basically one of our robo cars, and it has a kind of a laying platform on top with a load of actuators, and through that, uh, passengers can get on, they wear a VR headset, and they can experience what it would be like to be a robo car driving at full speed. For example, at Goodwood, when we went up the, the Goodwood hill climb, we recorded that, the data, the visuals, and we input them into the simulator, and then, People can come in it and they can lay on, lay on top of the robo car and feel what it would be like to drive these cars. So the first side of that is that we can do that with with what we've already with tracks we've already driven. But the other part is we can do tracks that we've never driven would be too dangerous to drive and also just don't exist. So for example, if you want to take uh, some tracks from video games or just ones that 
that our team have created, we could do that and people could experience what it would be like to drive on those tracks. Wow, so you can actually feel the G-forces as well as seeing the drive, that's super cool. Yeah. And because everything's digital, you could even imagine like virtual obstacles and, and virtual power-ups. Oh yeah, Matt talked about that too. It's definitely possible. Uh, as I said, the, the, the amount of data that we have on these cars, we can kind of make anything happen. So if we wanted to go down that route of, of, of kind of a more entertainment side of things, I, I grew up playing all of these games. I, I played Mario Kart as a kid, I played Forza, I played Gran Turismo, I played all of these kind of racing games. So yeah, it's, it's kind of a side of me that I would be interested in myself, but it's definitely something that we could make happen. So I mean, it's possible then, you know, when you're driving a Mario Kart game and you see a power up, you can steer over to it and, you know, hit it. Um, so it's possible, I guess, then that a robo race car could I don't know, can you explain how that would work? Like, could it? Could you virtually put a power up and have it try to drive over to it and pick it up? Yeah, essentially. So it's very similar to, uh, to Formula E's attack mode. You have a, a section of the track that you have to drive over a gate, and if you drive through that gate, you get a power up. And what we could do as engineers is the cars are out on track driving as they would be, and we can say, okay, on this part of this corner, there's a power up. The, the cars would, would kind of adjust their line to go a bit wider through the corner, but then they get the power up and they can they can use that for the for the remainder of the race or for the next you know couple of seconds. However, we want to do that from from that side of things, but absolutely, it's possible. Now this is amazing because you know motorsports grew up in reality, right? Mm -hmm. Everything was reality. You got gears and nuts and bolts and tires and wheels and screeching and engines and everything like that. Now we're entering the world where everything can be digital but you can have it in the real world. And so you can have, you know, video game concepts brought to uh, a, a real life race where you have, you know, the world's best physics engine, physics. It didn't need a sequel. They <laughs> just came out with physics, right? So you can actually implement that into the real world into what is essentially a game. Yeah, and of course, the main thing is that when you don't put humans in the car, you can do some much crazier things. So the whole safety side of it can go. So you can do stuff that you would never normally do. You can do loop the loops, you can do figure eight tracks where cars are crossing over and have to calculate, is it safe to go full speed now? Because I'm about to go across the path of another car. There's so many things that you could do from that side that you'd never be able to do with humans in the car. So that's definitely something that we could look to in the future. Exactly, I mean, having a figure eight track, basically every video game that has racing that isn't you know, a racing simulator has an, a figure eight track and you're going to be slamming into people. Did he also say loop de loops? I mean, right. Why not? If, if there's no humans in the car and you're not worried about anyone dying because, you know, what's the worst thing that can happen with the loop de loop? The, the car goes, whoop, <laughs> right? Who cares? It's just a robot. You can rebuild it. I mean, wow. that is, and you know, yeah, loop de loops, figure eights, all these things that usually you would be like, oh, we can't do that because people will die you can now implement into the racing thing. And not only that, it, they could do it, right? It's not just gonna be like explosions, right? It's going to be like, can you imagine how cool that would look in real life to have that actually happening? You know what I just thought of? What? I just thought of another possibility. Okay. It's almost limitless. Why not race through buildings? Like picture this, you can you know, take a left and go through the lobby of a building and cut like 15 seconds off your time you know, you, I mean, of course, you have to go a little slower because you're going through a building, I assume. So it's sh so actual shortcuts through actual buildings. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Imagine imagine uh, the races on the Las Vegas Strip and you could be like, you know what? Well, our team is going to take a shortcut through the Bellagio <sighs> Hotel. Could you could you do that? Well, I asked Matt if they could do it. Yeah, I mean, technically it's possible. <laughs> Whether you'd get some uh, some kind of approval to do that, I don't know. But from a, from a technical point of view, yeah, why not? Again, you're... you're all the cool things that they put in video games, because there's pretty much no limits in video games, because again, the cars are just an, just an entity and you can put them wherever you want. They don't have all the problems of oh, a very loud engine that would probably break all of the glass in the building. Now all of a sudden you're like, oh, an electric car, basically the same thing as a, as a virtual entity in a video game. Right. So yeah, why not have it go through a, the building? Why not have a, a big race through a big mall? But again, the point of Robo Race isn't even the racing. Right? We're talking about all this cool stuff, but that's not the point of it. What is the point? It's communicating the future. Oh yeah, Matt brought up this point. Yeah, so it's, the thing that we're trying to promote really is that it's an entertainment platform, but also we're trying to better the 
uh, road car economy and the quality of road cars from a self-driving point of view. So we want to create entertaining races for fans to watch, but also stuff that's going to be applicable on the roads. So in terms of what we call vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications, where cars are talking to one another at all times to work out where I am in relation to everyone else, or has there been an accident up ahead that I need to learn to avoid or slow down to? So we're kind of trying to integrate all of those into what will be an entertaining form of race or challenge, demo, however we want to package it. The idea is that we're, we're constantly working to better the world from a self-driving point of view, which is the way that cars will be going and hopefully do do go in the future. And that's so important, okay? The, the idea that you're going to be exciting all of these people, whether they're young, whether they're old, whether they were into racing or whether they weren't, right? To see a car with nobody in it mm -hmm. and see it ripping around a racetrack. And I think eventually they're going to get faster than humans because oh, yeah. if you don't need to put the steering wheel and the pedals and the seat in there and the human, right? The human adds quite a bit of weight. You know, if you could take out even a light person, you'd say 150 pounds. And you're taking out all the safety features. Right. You don't need the airbags. You don't need the, the halo system. You don't need hardly any safety systems in the car, right? Because if it crashes, it crashes. Right. And that's a really good point. I talked to Matt about that. The fact that you can actually race a human against an autonomous driver. So, I mean, there's a whole bunch of new possibilities that open up when you introduce humans and autonomous driving. Right now, they're just doing it with humans to try and teach them how to use the technology. Right. But in the future, yeah, you could mix the two. And the amazing thing about this is that people are going to start to get excited about electric autonomous cars just as electric autonomous cars are going to be entering not the raceway but your driveway yeah that's a really good point because people are going to be able to experience autonomous driving without actually having to sit in a tesla or an autonomous car because let's face it most people in the world haven't experienced that yet i mean we have just begun if you've driven in a tesla to experience a little bit of autonomy mm -hmm. but most people when you tell them that are just like what are you talking about <laughs> Right? They can't imagine it. They can't picture it actually happening. But once you get past that step, once you realize that you can send a dog to pick your mom up from the airport, you, you realize that the possibilities are truly limitless. And the other important thing is that it showcases talented teams of people, which will inspire others to get into these fields. That's a really good point. It makes it accessible now for people who didn't picture themselves before as being able to become race car drivers. Because before, in the past, if you said to a little kid, like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they're like, a race car driver. That was about it when it came to racing. They hardly ever said, I don't remember ever hearing them say, like, I want to be an engineer that makes race cars. This, it makes it much more exciting to be part of that team that's actually going to program the cars and engineer the cars to make them go faster. Right, because right now, a lot of modern racing is all centered around the drivers, right? right. The drivers, they're good looking, they're, they drive the cars very fast, and really, those people aren't the stars of the show. As Matt said, you can take the best driver and put them in the worst car and they're still not going to be able to win. That's right. So it's, it's again, it's all about engineering and now you're engineering the driver themselves, basically. I mean, and that's a whole other aspect, a whole thing that we haven't seen before, and that's going to become really, really important. Yeah, and what I'm excited about is that our partnership with RoboRace is allowing us to go to England and check out Robo Race, and we're going to be bringing you along as we interview the teams, check out the cars, find out the scoop on what Robo Race is and where they are with their development. Yeah, and I, yeah, I can't wait to uh, get in the race car and race it around the track, and then see if they can chase me down with the autonomous car. Yeah, I guess we'll see if we can make that happen. <laughs> yeah, oh, of course, of course. <laughs> anyway, comment below if you've got questions for us about what you'd like us to find out for you when we go. And thank you to our subscribers and our patrons for making this possible. If it weren't for you. Let me just say, mm -hmm. we wouldn't have gotten the access that we did. If our channel was tiny, there's no reason why Robo Race would be interested in talking with us. But because we're growing, they were like, okay, your viewers seem like just the kind of people who are interested in this technology. Mm -hmm. And yeah, come on over and check it out. So your subscription and your support makes a difference. Thank you so much for watching. Now, now you know. know.